Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this webinar, Clinical Uses of Mass Spectrometry. I am Michelle Ashton of Labberts, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration. It is made possible by an open educational grant from Agilent. Agilent has had no input in the selection of speakers, content, or mode of presentation. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speakers during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrow at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the Ask a Question box. I now present today's speakers, Nina Aubrey and Philip Sadamont. Both are from the laboratory prison at the University of Lille. To learn more about our speakers, please visit the speaker tab at the top of the presentation window. Nina and Philip, you may now begin your presentation. So thank you, Michelle, for the very kind introduction. Thank you. So today we will talk about clinical uses of mass spectrometry, specifically focusing on the new advances of the past years, which we believe will make a huge impact in the clinical world. So um, just to be more specific, we will be talking about the methods which are not yet uh, routinely used, but that have a great potential of being used in oncology, either during surgery or during a pathological exams. Um, so first, just a bit of uh, introduction of, uh, about mass spectrometry in clinics. Uh, in these days, it is uh, routinely used to diagnose metabolism deficiencies. Uh, to determine uh, biomarkers and enzymes and for uh, toxicological testing. And there are many advantages of mass spectrometry over other techniques because they can be used to analyze fluids and solid tissue and not really a lot of uh, amount of sample is necessary. There is no labeling required. We can multiplex analysis. We can obtain detailed molecular identity. Uh, we can do qualitative, quantitative um, analysis, and we can analyze a large variety of biomolecules, such as metabolites, proteins, and pharmaceutical compounds. And uh, also what is nice about these methods that we can use them for targeted or untargeted analysis. And the last part is really more relevant for discovery-based research. There are several uh, groups of techniques which have been involved in clinical research, such as classical mass spectrometry techniques uh, used in clinical laboratory, uh, and we said, for example, GC and LCMS. Um, mass spectrometry imaging has been used as well as uh, ambient techniques, and uh, the recent years, the development of intraoperative techniques, also called IOMS, uh, used for real-time and in vivo analysis during surgeries. So let's just briefly go through the classical techniques. Here we outline a short timeline of the uh, important events of the techniques that have been routinely used in clinical labs. So historically, the major impacts have been made um, by confirmation of immunoassays with uh, positive drug screens by GCMS, the identification of inborn errors of metabolism, and analysis of steroid hormones. Uh, more recently, uh, MS has dra dramatically improved the time required for microbi uh, micro microbial identification. And this is the part that we will also speak a little bit more about. Uh, once drug screening became mandatory for employees in U.S., several toxicology ex uh, labs started using this technology. And several studies have demonstrated that uh, urine testing was very cost-effective, and they also started using this methodology for 
for other uh, for for other analysis, such as therapeutic uh, drug monitoring. The major limitation of GCNS is that the analyte needs to be volatile, and therefore most clinical uh, assays requires uh, multiple extraction and purification steps, along with the uh, chemical derivatization to render the analyte sufficiently volatile for analysis. Atmospheric pressure ionization techniques, such as electrospy ionization, combined with high performance and CMS, were the next major analytical improvement that enabled MS uh, for clinical laboratory uses. So indeed, this technology is very high throughput and cost effective, especially the development of multiplex analysis. And uh, in the microbiology lab, lab, the development of MALDI combined with talc mass analyzers allowed for rapid identification of microbes. So before implementation of MALDI of microbiology, laboratories depended on gram stains, culture, biochemical tests, and susceptibility testing. But with the development of the Brooker Biotyper, uh, it became very simple and very fast. So basically what happens is that after culturing, the smears are deposited onto metallic sample plates and mixed with MALDI matrices. These are just regular organic matrices. The sample plate is inserted in the instrument and a laser is shot onto the sample for analysis. The molecules are then desorbed and ionized and separated based on their mass to charge ratio in the top analyzer. You can see a very nice schematic uh, in the middle of the slide. The uh, specific peaks are then generated, uh, are generated and compared to the spectral libraries. Studies have uh, as estimated that using these techniques has cut the total cost of reagents and labors by 50%, which is a great advance. The spectral library can be customly modified, so users can build their own database. So this is just one of the great examples of MS being used in everyday clinical analysis. So now we have reached um, now we have reached a part which we want to emphasize more about, which is a recap of technological advancements that we believe will have a really important part into the clinical world. We will present these techniques and a lot of new nice examples performed either in the clinical or biomedical labs. So it's, we will start with explaining about uh, MALDI. Uh, this was developed in 1985 by Karas and Hillenkamp that uses solid state samples mixed with specific molecular matrix to generate gate phase ions to be analyzed. In the late 90s, uh, MALDI MSI was introduced uh, and demonstrated its vast potential for biomarker discovery and has played a central role in clinical research linking classical histology and molecular analysis. So here are a few uh, breakpoints, uh, such as the identifications of first diagnostic markers, uh, but also integration with histology, uh, peptide MSI analysis on FFP tissue, and last, the uh, multicenter studies uh, in a way to standardize these techniques. So here we have the MALDI imaging MS. Um, this technique allows us to directly uh, maps molecular species such as uh, proteins, peptides, lipids, and metabolites, and is considered a cutting edge approach to better understand underlying processes in cells and biological systems. So, on top, you can see a slide with the tissue section with the applied D matrix. We shoot the laser on top of the section, and the molecules are desorbed and ionized, and then furthermore analyzed in the mass spectrometer. On the upper right side, you can see the mass spectrum that is created, and if we select a specific mass, we can actually generate a two-dimensional map of this specific mass. MALDI MSI is used in discovery-based research for biomarker discovery. As I mentioned, it can be used uh, to analyze uh, metabolites, lipids, and proteins. We can analyze fresh frozen tissue, FFP tissue, but we have to be aware that a specific sample preparation is required uh, depending on what kind of uh, molecules we would like to detect. 
So in cancer research, MSI has been used for tumor typing and especially the identification of tumor origin in metastatic tissues, um, as well as grading and may provide prognostic information while looking at the tumor microenvironment. We can study, for example, hypoxia-derived prognostic biomarkers such as glycans, which can be used to predict cancer progression and patient outcome for personalized medicine. So here is uh, an example on the uh, bottom right corner of the uh, analysis of uh, a tumor uh, in, in Hachmer heterogeneity, and on the bottom left corner, uh, an example of uh, analysis of glycans on tissue microarrays, uh, where we can distinguish some specific uh, uh, signals uh, in tumor and non-tumors uh, tissues. So one of the main breakthroughs in this field, as we mentioned already previously, is the possibility to image not only fresh frozen, but also uh, FFPE tissue, which gives us access to a large clinical tissue bank. FFPE stands for formalin fixed and paraffin embedded, in which the fresh tissues are fixed in formalin and then transferred for conservation. So here I will just show you briefly how the sample preparation of these tissues works. So first we have an FFP slide, uh, which is cut to appropriate thicknesses. We wash the tissue in specific solvents to remove lipids and paraffin. We do the antigen retrieval step to break the disulfide bonds of proteins, which were caused by the fixation. We spray uh, trypsin or, um, <clears throat> or other enzymes in order to uh, break the proteins into smaller peptides. And then the final step is to apply the matrix on top of the tissue. Here is just an, two uh, images which show the distribution of specific uh, triptychally digested peptides and the mass spectra that we usually acquire. So here we can uh, see an example of the uh, fimb fimbria analysis of patients with a high-grade serous carcinoma um, and uh, a round-robin study of FFP TMA analysis. I don't go further in detail for this uh, Fimbria uh, example as we will dig deeper into it later. But not only uh, can we see proteins, but also we can see metabolites in these uh, FFP tissues. So these strategies of MSI allow us to obtain the spatial distribution of whole digested proteins, but the identif identification is still very difficult directly from the tissue. In fact, it really relies on MSMS fragmentation spectra quality. So for a long time, top-down FFP analysis was difficult, and for bottom-up strategy, the enzymatic digestion is complicated to read. So um, how could we bridge this uh, localization aspect to the classical large-scale proteomics done by tissue extraction and LCMS? Well, uh, in PRISM uh, lab, we aimed at filling this gap and correlate the protein localization with their identification by using specially resolved microproteomics. So what happens is that we use specific technique called the uh, microsampling by liquid microjunction microextraction with uh, uh, liquid extraction surface analysis, LISA. And uh, in this particular example, what we have done is that we use the segmentation analysis on a small d image of a red brain. We were able to select specific regions uh, on which we did two uh, specific uh, microextractions. On approximately 1,900 cells extracted, 1,350 identified prote proteins were found. Specifically, a, major, uh, a majority of them were common between the zones, but we also find between 200 and 300 of proteins specific to each position. So we tested then the, reprodu the reproducibility of the extraction by processing several following slides of the brain at exactly the same location, which showed us less than 5% variation uh, in the protein content between each run. So 
So one of the main applications in the technique of, uh, of the technique in the lab is to study the fimbria presenting high-grade serous carcinoma. This specific AGSC represents 85 of epithelial cancer of the reprodu reproductive organs and is partitioned in 70% of serous type and 30% of mucosal type. When the lesions usually diagnosed, the lesions are usually diagnosed in the advanced stages. So the prognosis is usually bad even with heavy surgery and chemotherapy. By analysis, uh, by uh, analyzing uh, digested proteins, we were first able to analyze this tumor and detect specific molecular signatures that, were, that we extensively studied by using a chemical inkjet printer to deposit trypsin directly onto uh, discrete regions of less than one millimeter square. So after protein digestion, the liquid microjunction is performed to retrieve all the peptides that were digested and the data coming from the identification of proteins in both cancer and benign regions are compared. Uh, it has been possible by this uh, approach to obtain different important signaling pathways involved in cancer processes and some proteins already known as biomarkers in the bi biography. The comprehension of the pathology has really evolved these past 10 years, and clinicians now think that the majority of the ovarian cancer are arising not from the ovarian tissue, but from the fimbrial part of the fallopian tube. The communication be between the secretory cells of the fimbria and the ovarian epithelium by especially reactive oxygen species, or ROS, are believed to induce a molecular differentiation of the secretory population into precancerous lesions. And these lesions are often detected from BRCA1 mutated patients who undergone prophylactic ovarectomy and can be traced from P53 lesions to different intermediate grades, leading to the migration of cancerous cells on the ovarian causing aggressive AGSC. So in order to evaluate the progression of the lesions into uh, HGSC, we decided to look for those small numbers of cells which are bearing specific phenotypes of uh, precancerous lesions. The originality of uh, our approach was to use the P53 and KI67 immunohistochemistry staining obtained during routine analysis of pathologists. So after uh, they analyzed these slides and detect the precancerous lesions, they gave them to us um, to uh, be analyzed. So when the cells were responding either to P53, KI67, or both, then we used that uh, answering to the immunohistochemistry to direct our analysis. So we first unmount our uh, cover slips from the slides, and then we use them for imaging and micro extraction. extraction. After LCMS analysis, we were able to significantly separate the different lesions based on their proteins. We could distinguish the pathways between the early stages of normal P53 and still samples, which showed an overexpression of the silicon 4 mediating signaling pathways that affect cellular proliferation, migration, and endocytosis, but also integrins family cell surface interaction, which are involved in metastasis. So the second widely used technique in MS analysis was invented in parallel to MALDI and uh, is the uh, electrospray ionization, or ESI. It was developed by Fenn and collaborators in 1984. In this uh, technique, the, the analytes are present in a liquid phase, and uh, this, uh, the, this solvent is sprayed in front of a mass spectrometer, and uh, on, we apply uh, an electrical current in order to uh, promote the ionization of the analyte. By definition, the ionization sources is working under atmospheric pressure, or AIMS, so the samples that we analyze can be in the native state. So just to go quickly through some of the points in the timeline, uh, first the creation of nano-ESI to improve protein identification by LCMS, 
then the creation of DESI uh, to perform uh, imaging mass spectrometry, uh, LACI for laser ablation, electrospray analysis, and previously mentioned LISA. And here, uh, we just want to mention that DESI has been the most widely spread among them today to do 2D and 3D imaging, either for tumor lipid profiles, tumor subtyping, or prediction of metastatic status. So, um, in this um, uh, available techniques uh, of atmospheric uh, pressure uh, mass spectrometry, uh, we'll focus on some of them uh, and begin with in panel A uh, with the DESI MSI. So, in this uh, schematic diagram, we can uh, see how an electrospray is directed onto the sample surface to desorb molecules that are then analyzed and its application to uh, brain tumor. So the top uh, spectrum shows the low tumor cell concentration region infiltrating into the gray matter, and the bottom spectrum shows the CMS of dense tumor regions with high tumor cell concentration. Um, just under, we can see uh, the CMS uh, ion image, uh, which shows the distribution of specific glycerophospholipids depending on the area. So the second technique, the PASMS or probe electrospray mass spectrometry, uh, shows the principle of the operation. So the probe is held in contact with the tissue to be analyzed and then is placed inside of the SE nebulization plume. Here we show the application to colon cancer and uh, on the top and the bottom spectra with the presence of specific glycerophospholipids in either normal or cancerous colon tissue. So in panel C, the diagram explains us how the TSMS works for touch spray uh, MS. Uh, so similarly to the PZ, uh, needle adsorbs the molecules of interest by touching solids or solutions. Then this um, needle is covered with uh, small drops of uh, solvent, uh, and uh, we apply a current on it to directly generate a spray at its uh, tip. So um, in the application here, the prostate cancer analysis is showed with its uh, mass spectrum, which is revealing the presence of uh, specific molecules uh, in the region outlined below. Uh, which correspond on the biopsy uh, to uh, prostate malignant tissue. So as uh, it was determined by uh, histopathological evaluation. So on the right hand side, you can see a table which summarizes the potentially relevant AIMS techniques that can be used in the ultra-operative um, circumstances. And the principal molecules or biomolecules that can be seen with these methods. We will dig a little bit further in the, into the following part uh, right after this uh, recap slide. So to summarize, how, does, how do molecular information obtained by MS can be related to health and disease? Well, you know, in fact, um, any small modification in homeostasis leads to changes in biological pathways. And when pathology brings imbalance, the molecular profiles are dysregulated and all biomolecules are equally affected. So basically, by following proteins and lipids can therefore give insight into health and disease states. So now we have reached the heart of our presentation corresponding to the emergence of the more or less uh, real-time and in vivo techniques. Uh, which have been created since uh, 2010. The first one was developed, uh, uh, was developed in, um, in UK, the intelligent eye knife based on RAMES, rapid evaporative ionization mass spectrometry. And uh, so other techniques are used uh, with uh, lasers uh, as the sampling methods, like the PEARL for picosecond infrared laser mass spectrometry, developed in 2015, and the spider mask developed by uh, the PRISM uh, laboratory in 2014. Then in 2017, uh, the mass spec pen was uh, introduced. 
The IOMS techniques um, are developed to help with the cancer diagnosis and margin evaluation principally, which are difficult to uh, observe during the pathological exam and that can take between 30 to 40 minutes during surgery in classical operation. There are two main approaches, one which is offline and watch one with, uh, which is online. The first one is taking the sample out of the patient and uh, perform extemporaneous analysis in the room next to the operating theater. It can be a biomedical or a pathology uh, lab. The second approach is the use of a surgical handpiece handheld directly by the surgeon and performed in vivo and in real time. So here are the several techniques that have been developed over the years in this field, such as the ionized technology developed by Zoltan Takas at the Imperial College of London, the spider mass system developed here in PRISM Labs, the mass spec pen developed by Eberlin Labs in University of Texas in Austin, Austin LDA MS developed by Stratos in 2009 in Germany, the pearl developed by Zarin Asar in University of Toronto, and the stereotactic MS developed by Agar Lab at Harvard Medical School in Boston. But in this final example, they used uh, as the extra extemporaneous analysis. But all of these techniques have uh, in common uh, the, the same goal to help cancer diagnosis and uh, to ultimately help the patient uh, survival and outcome. So we will mainly focus and explain the uses of the INIF the mass spec pen and the spider mass technology to give you a taste of the different methodology used. So first we will start off with the ionized technology. Here uh, is the first uh, system, uh, so the intelligent ion knife based on rings. The ion knife produces gas phase ions of evaporated tissue after the contact with the surgical tool. The cast phase ions are then sub subsequently transmitted to the mass spectrometer through the Teflon, through the Teflon tubing or Tygon tubing, which is uh, biocompatible, uh, which can be more than one meter length using a Venturi jet uh, jet pump. So this uh, technique is compatible with uh, commonly used surgical devices such as uh, electrosurgical electrodes, but also surgical diathermy, bipolar forceps, or cavitron. Um, ultrasonic surgical aspirator and utilizes the surgical aerosols or smokes formed during normal surgical interventions. The analytes uh, detection uh, detected our metabolites and lipids in the negative ion mode polarity. So the um, uh, analyzed molecular signatures are then subjected to classification using multivariate classifiers. So over the years, it has been used in different applications, such as the oncology of surgery, breast cancer, diagnostic and margin assessment, brain tumor analysis, and gastroenterology, such as implementation of an endoscopic system and the atmospheric pressure biotyping. So the other techniques we mentioned is the mastectomy. Um, uh, so it consists of a syringe pump delivering a defined water volume to the sampling probe, uh, which we can see here on the right side of the screen. Um, it's connected to PTFE tubing, which are integrated with valves to transfer the water to and from the tissue. Uh, this device is uh, pen-sized for uh, probing of biological uh, specimens. So during the experiment, uh, as we can see on the left side of the screen, um, a water droplet is deposited onto the tissue uh, for three second period, allowing the attraction extraction of the analytes. So this droplet is vacuum extracted to the mass spectrometer and analyzed. The system is based on non-destructive liquid solid extraction and can be applied in vivo for in vivo tissue analysis. So here is just a couple of examples of how the mass spec pen has been used in different applications uh, while subjected to multivariate statistical analysis. 
And here we can see uh, different examples such as uh, breast cancer, thyroid cancer, ovary cancer, and lung cancer with, uh, to classify between normal and cancer tissues with a large number of patients. So now let's go to the spider mass system, which we are developing in the in the lab for uh, in vivo and uh, real time analysis uh, using a laser in the infrared uh, wavelength. Uh, and this system was introduced in 2014. So the spider mass is tuned to excite the most intense vibrational band of water molecules at 2.94 micrometer, micrometer in a process described as water-assisted laser desorption and ionization. So the spider mass system is composed of the mini-invasive laser microprobe to generate the ions, which is the first part of the system. Then uh, we have a transfer line, which is uh, transferring in uh, real time the uh, air, uh, air analytes uh, from the probe to the uh, MS systems. Um, and then the acquired molecular spectra are uh, then subjected to multivariate analysis and classification models are built based on the different tissue types. So basically what happens is that we can teach we can teach the model to recognize, for example, cancer or normal tissue. Once the model is created, we can interrogate the model in vivo. This has already been performed in one of our previous studies and the Oncovet clinic in Lille. Since the data is very complex to analyze and we are often very limited with the amount of tissue, we have been currently developing software based on uh, CNN. And uh, in this current state, the spider mass doesn't provide the imaging dimension. So the spider mass prototype can be connected to the mass spectrometer via the biocompatible Tygon tubing and to a different variety of mass spectrometers. Here are a few. Here are the few examples. Um, it can be linked to a QTOF instrument such as a Synapse and Xevo from Waters or high mass resolution spectrometers such as the Orbitrap. This really shows the versatility of the technique and the adaptation depending on the user's needs. We also did uh, quite a lot of different applications with the spider mass system in the first uh, upper top uh, left uh, corner. You can see the example how non-invasive the spider mass system is because we were able to perform analysis uh, in vivo on skin. We can see the different metabolites and lipids that are coming off from the tissue. The technique is also able to analyze protein standards deposited on the sample holder. Here is an example on the bottom left, on the bottom left part of how we analyze protein standards uh, such as the ubiquitin and gives us the electrospray-like spectra with the multiply charged state. The last example on the top right corner, you can see the bacterial biotapping where we were able to separate different strands of bacteria based on their molecular profiles. But one of the major studies uh, uh, was conducted on dog sarcoma samples. Uh, sarcoma is a type of a highly heterogeneous tumor which are difficult from time to time to distinguish by uh, histology. So, um, you know, in, in more, there is a, a large number of uh, pathological type of sarcoma. So we were, we were up to the challenge to see whether we can distinguish between normal and cancerous tissues and uh, different uh, pathological types. So in this uh, study, we used uh, so uh, uh, ex vivo biopsies uh, obtained from uh, surgery of dogs, uh, we uh, had to cut these, um, these samples in half to have a morphological control and uh, the spider mass analysis on its uh, mirror uh, piece. So um, using these uh, techniques to uh, generate the, the spectra corresponding to each uh, situation, we were able to, uh, to to classify the, uh, the samples according to their uh, biological uh, content. 
So we can see on the tom on the bottom uh, corner that uh, the PCA uh, is showing really a nice separation between the normal and the cancerous uh, tissues. And uh, we can also see that the cancerous tissues are split in two uh, subgroups, which we will explain the origin uh, just right after. So in fact, this separation is coming from um, the presence of uh, necrotic tissues uh, inside the cancerous uh, subtype. And um, we have been able to create a classification model taking in, into account this uh, necrosis um, signals. So um, the, using this uh, system, we were able to see that the necrosis part is really distinguishing uh, from the cancerous one and the normal tissues. On the top uh, right side of the slide, you can see that we were able to classify the uh, sarcoma uh, according to their grade, uh, which is great for uh, grading during uh, surgery. So um, we did uh, some uh, cross-validation of the markers uh, detected with the spider mass using the uh, MALDI MSI technique, which has uh, proven to be robust. So here we can see that uh, we have some uh, specific uh, markers for the normal on top and uh, cancerous on the bottom part uh, regions. Um, and uh, those uh, signals are, uh, I were identified in real time and uh, um, some uh, markers share their uh, specific localization between the spider mass and the MALDI uh, MSI. So in order to do, uh, to interrogate the classification model in real time and to do the actual assessment, of one of the tissues. We selected a tissue which had uh, a mixed composition of normal cancer and necrosis. We, we started shooting the uh, tissue and uh, based on the MS spectra acquired, we interrogated the classification model and gave us back the real-time classification feedback. And as you can see, it was able to specify between normal cancer and necrosis part of the tissue. So then we went to uh, the vet surgery room to, um, to see if the system is able to work during surgeries. So we first uh, um, installed the system and sat beside the surgeon while uh, doing uh, these uh, surgeries. We were getting the uh, ex vivo biopsy and analyzing them uh, in real time. Um, then we gave the hand probe directly to the, to the surgeon, uh, which uh, used it uh, during these uh, surgeries. And uh, the generated uh, mass spectra showed their uh, ability to um, uh, be linked to tissue-specific molecular profiles. And for the last example, we want to show you that we are able to do direct protein analysis of human saliva. Here we use the five microliters of human saliva with uh, five microliters of FA in water and ACN directly onto a glass slide and analyzed. The mass spectra produced, uh, as you can see, we have uh, specific peaks. And then we also have this mass range where we can see mainly the protein. And here, one of these proteins came, started really popping up, which is at the mass 875, 0.8. We performed some MSMS analysis, and we were able to see that we detect salivary ac acidic proline-rich phosphoprotein 1,2, which is present in the human saliva. The PRH1 that we detect provided a protective and reparative environment for the dental enamel. So as you can see, we really can use the spider mass technology in a variety of different applications in the clinical world. So to recap, how the spider mass developed in PRISM can help clinicians in their daily routine, really? Well, the spider mass can help providing any type of material, as we showed and is giving its molecular signature, like uh, a barcode. So 
this can then be used to differentiate between various classes of samples and classify them. So um, during surgery, it can be used for grading, modding, uh, detection, and even extent of rejection assessment without damaging the surrounding tissues. And let's not forget that in the lab, it can be used for drug screening, bacterial biotyping, amongst other non-clinical related applications like uh, pesticide analysis or food safety. So lastly, our last learning objective was to treat how the MS development has advanced in the clinical labs and uh, hospital. So it has developed from vacuum-based MS to AEMS and from process to direct analysis of samples. The MS technology has made a lot of huge steps forward in these last decades, bringing us into the era of in vivo and real-time analysis. Plus, the, uh, the, the bioinformatic tools that have been developed have powered up the ability to analyze huge data sets and make classification or discover new biomarkers. So um, we wanted to finish this talk by thanking all of the PRISM members which are doing a great state-of-the-art work obtaining this deep analysis using imaging and multi-omics techniques for diagnosis and prognosis biomarker hunting. Our aims are to better understand the physiopathology in oncology and in neurology and discover new mechanisms to treat them by therapeutical or technological innovation. And we want to specifically thank the partners involved in the SpiderMass project. And last but not least, all of you for attending this webinar. And we will be more than happy to answer any of your questions. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Nina and Philip, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Our speakers will answer as many questions as time permits. Okay, let's get started. Our first question is, when do we expect the first experiments performed during human surgery? So we expect our first experiments to be performed in 2026. Yeah, which is uh, quite uh, an objective because uh, we have uh, several steps to uh, to uh, achieve before going uh, into the surgery room because it's really uh, the last uh, and the more important uh, goal of the project. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. When do we expect to sell the first commercial spider mass prototype? So at the moment, we have a, um, a lab a, a prototype, um, but we plan soon to uh, have uh, something to be uh, sellable. So we think that maybe in the, next two yeah, years? In, the, in the next two years, we will be able to commercially provide um, uh, prototypes in order to uh, run uh, at least uh, research uh, in vitro analysis. In vitro analysis. analysis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. Is is there any link between all the omics data banks? For example, genomic, transcriptomic, proteomic, and genomic data or lipidomic data? Well, uh, that's a huge question, in fact. There is no direct link between the genomic, transcriptomic, and proteomic uh, data banks and omics results, as we know today more and more that um, not every gene which is expressed is transferred into a protein. Um, what we can say still is that uh, maybe we can do the, the link between the lipidomics data we are generating and the proteomics data we have uh, when there is a direct link uh, between the protein and the biosynthesis of the lipid uh, in questions. I would like to once again thank Nina and Philip for their presentations. 
I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Any questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank LabRoots and our educational sponsor, Adlint, for today's educational webcast. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye.